Hello everyone, this is Ben Lupton here, and this talk is the one we gave at CamJS number 3. CamJS was run from May 23rd to 26th, 2014 in Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's a camp, goes for three days. Um, it was in Melbourne this year, but they're doing it in Brisbane again at the around the end of this year. Um, it's amazing. It's a great opportunity to build great relationships and friendships um, with the people in the JavaScript community and just level up your skills because there's a bunch of mentors that fly in and they're really quite talented. They run a bunch of workshops. One of those workshops was mine and Damon's. Um, which was WebRTC and Web Components, a match made in heaven. So this workshop, which you're about to see, goes into the details about what WebRTC and Web Components are, um, how to use them, the potential, as well as why using them together is so damn powerful in regards to social innovation um, and building a communication infrastructure that everybody has a power of. Now, we had a pretty good turnout, um, so it went pretty well. Now, Damon, um, does like to avoid cameras, so at times he'll be talking in the video and you won't be able to see him. Um, but at, at later on I start directing the, the webcam to him to make sure you do get him in. Now the slides are available online, you can go to slides.com and the links will be below. So you can watch it and, and interact with the slides instead of just viewing them with the video. Alright, so thanks so much and enjoy the talk. Cheers. Huh? Yeah. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. We're gonna kick this off now. So, least chair scratching would be appreciated if that is entirely possible. At all. And I, I, think, <laughs> I think too, like what's gonna happen is we've, we've basically tried to structure this so you got half an hour kind of a, of listening, round about half an hour, and then you get stuck in with some some pretty hard. You know, well, whatever you want. And, and I think, like I was saying over there, we've got both web components and RT, web RTC. There'll be some of you who want to try using that stuff together. There'll be some of you who just want to have a hack around with web components. And there'll be some that want to play with web RTC. And I think we can cater for all of those kind of things. Probably by a hands up, though, um, who here has heard of web RTC or used web RTC a little bit? All right, so about half, which is good. What about web components? All right, about a quarter. All right, now, what would you guys be wanting to get out of this? Just shout some answers. So we can make sure we add that value. Anyone? Peer connection. Peer connection, all right, that's Damon's area. Yeah, I got that. Sweet. Cool. All right. So as long as we cover peer connection, we're set. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do a slide. <laughs> all right. Um, so to start off, I'm Ben, that's Damon. Hi. Hey. hey. All right, here we are. Why should you listen to us? Now, I've created a bunch of things, many things. Um, one history just the other doc pad. Um, work for a community or an open company called Beverly. I got into web components and web RTC with Interconnect. I wanted a tool for open source teams to actually be able to communicate with each other. Um, because ISC wants, like, I feel like throwing my laptop out a window every single time I use ISC because Everyone is talking over each other and it's so impersonal. I don't know anyone in my community um, and I can't relate to them. So I looked at a project called Squiggle, um, which provides like a presence and I wanted to really get into that and make that available to open teams because that's a paid project um, which per person. So it's really not viable when your team could be 250 people. Now that's Damon. All right. I, I do love MicroJS, thank you. <laughs> um, look, yeah, I, I think you, you decide whether you should listen to me or not. Um, I've done stuff. Um, but I think the, the thing that I, I've really tried to achieve with this WebRTC thing is do things in a way that doesn't just copy what everyone else is doing. Because you will notice in WebRTC space, there's a lot of kind of following the bouncing ball from, from Google. And I've tried to go back to the specs, see what they intended. And, and become disillusioned in that process with the actual implementation, but but aim for the high bar. Um, and I think we've got pretty close to that actually. Um, and I've done other stuff before that, been working with Node for a while, and you know I've got some pretty strong opinions. So you may not agree with the way I do things. Like I, I tend to choose for a common JS kind of browserify approach uh, for building apps. So everything in RTCO I follows that kind of pattern. You, you you I don't even give you a choice. Like you you can use browserify to get there and to to get to another pattern if you want. But, but for me, I just was like, decided, and that's, and that's a whole other discussion, which I think we're covering in Node up tonight too, so a um, little brief plug there. Cool. 
And so together we joined forces because I needed to use WebRTC and I looked into it and eventually we came to the decision to use Damon's thing, which is RTC IO, which, did you introduce that? No, yet. Uh, no, we will. No, no. And, and, and to be clear, that's like a Nectar project. So yep. Nectar basically said, Damon, for the last eight months, you just build open source libraries for WebRTC, which is kind of cool. Like, it's, I'm very happy to be paid to do that as part of my job. <laughs> so that's really cool. That's available on GitHub as well. So why are we here and why should you care um, at all about WebRTC and stuff? Um, pretty much for WebRTC, it allows you to create apps that actually talk to each other. And not just like, let's do a socket connection, but actually let's create something where you can actually see each other. And when you actually get the app first starting and you can hook into a webcam and then you can apply filters to the webcam or whatever, it's like, holy cow, I'm interacting with hardware again. It's actually as if I'm coding with C. So, so but using the nice stuff of the web. So it's, it's really quite powerful to be able to give front end web developers the ability to interact with hardware again. Um, now, another aspect to this is WebRTC also allows us to start solving social problems again, um, front-end web developers that is, because as front-end web developers we really like to solve just like tech meta issues. Let's create Grunt, let's create Gulp, let's create another build system or 270 static site generators, right? <laughs> That's a nice dig at yourself. <laughs> I know, it is. <laughs> It's even a dig because I created the static site generator.net listing with a list of them using a static site generator. Um, so for that, it's interesting because like through the maintenance of my projects, I've discovered that any tech solution has a very limited lifespan. That could be 10 years, it could be six months or even a week, um, depending on how quick the competition is. When social problems generally last a lot longer, everyone has pretty much the same social problems and they have like a much wider base. So it allows you to solve like a social problem, be it like maybe isolation or communication or something like that and have something that is long lasting um, and just like really solves like a different market case and creating a new tool for a bunch of developers. Now web components um, is really quite nifty because unlike say things like NPM, Bower, component, what's there's probably a bunch more, but they're the big ones, right? Um, we now have like a packaging system that is using web standards and for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it's quite interesting because with this process, web apps actually become remixable. So if you look at, um, if I open up Skype, it's not gonna connect at all because I'm offline, right? But it actually allows us to start remixing apps. If I don't like the way Skype looks, I can actually take all the web components from it, if it was coded with web components, and actually start remixing it, start taking that bit, take it out, and just really, um, it's really cool because it's kind of like the music scene, right? Where everyone remixes all the different songs. So now we can start being DJs of web apps, and that doesn't require that much technical expertise. We can just mix it up. Polymer, the Polymer team are actually doing some tools there to actually allow you to drag and drop them, which is really cool. Now, together, the potential for this is we can eventually build Skype and Dates. It's not there yet. These are both bleeding edge texts. They, they will break in pretty much every single browser release that they both them. myself and Damon know about. Um, but they are going to be based on standards and they will eventually lay the foundation for perhaps the next 25 years. Um, now, the reason why this is so vitally important is because the WebRTC finally puts the power of communication in our hands. And ours is in the people, as in the, the tech community or whoever, right? With remixable web applications, that could be anyone, just a layman as well. So the telcos and the government, they're really interested in WebRTC. And, and at the same time, they're, they're, they're quite scared. Yeah. Because it, it does challenge their business model quite significantly. Yeah, because when you can start having where every phone has an internet connection and then we can all start creating our own communication infrastructure, it's quite threatening to the telcos. So they're actually the biggest backers and the biggest supporters of WebRTC. Um, WebRTC is pretty much made by telcos for telcos. And then amazing people like Damon create libraries so you can actually use it as web developers. Our um, Nictor as well. I should, I should yeah, swap out Damon for Nictor because there is a bunch of people behind that. Um, so, what are they? Um, what can I do with them? WebRTC, we're going to answer peer-to-peer -peer networking, but we're going to cover that. So, 
the potential there is P2P network. Yeah, you actually want to do this with a TCS? No, I, the thing is, okay, so the, the reason I'm actually really happy to have that <laughs> is because he gives a really nice structured introduction and he also is very passionate about it. Like, I'm, I'm passionate about technology and making technology accessible. I'm very rarely in video anywhere. Like, I'd, so, so when it was really good when Ben came along and started saying, "Hey, look, this is awesome," you know, I, I really love what this is doing, and and he came in with a much more passionate kind of social vision, and I, I actually think you tell the story better of what you can do and what it enables you to do. When we get in the nitty gritty detail, you'll be hearing plenty from me, and, and I'll be running around happy to help anyone, and we'll do that sort of stuff. But Ben, you keep cracking on. All right, sweet. You tell it well, and if I may interject and just you know bug yeah. you every now and again. Cool, that sounds good. All right, so the peer-to-peer -peer networking, um, that just you know, is basically exactly what it says. It allows one browser to communicate to another browser. Um, there's some specs around that, um, but that's pretty much the gist of it. You do need, um, I'll cover that a bit later. Now there's also the media capture aspect, so we can now do use microphones and webcams and hardware integration, so we can actually call physical phones. That's another reason why this is by telcos for telcos. Um, so there's tech behind that called SIP. Now the peer-to-peer -peer networking aspect is quite cool because you know it can start off as a basic chat, but then there's projects like WebTorrent, which actually allows you to download torrents completely within your browser. Um, that's exciting because has anyone used, what was that thing, Get Popcorn Time? Has anyone seen that? Yeah. Right, so things like that are like potential what WebRTC can unlock, where you can download torrents using web technologies. So for anyone who hasn't seen Get Popped On Time, it's like a, you download movies via torrents, it's really nice, beautiful interface, you select the movie you want and then it's instantly streaming, um, completely with client-side tech, I think. Right, um, now the other aspect to this is bandwidth spreading, there's some really interesting ideas behind this. So one of them is you log into a website, let's say, I don't know, Microsoft.com, a really popular website, let's say Google.com, that's more popular, right? <laughs> Um, so you can go on there and then let's say we have a client-side script that then utilizes your computer in a botnet to start mining bitcoins, right? So that's another potential for, for this. Now there's another aspect to that as well, which is like a PSCDN project that was released or announced and then bought out. Yeah, I think they did a bit of work. So one, the, the concept behind that was quite clever in the fact that obviously a CDN is, is something we, we all go to on a public sort of thing and get reason, we all know what it is. So one, these, these few guys from, I think they're doing MIT or something, they basically suggested that, well, what if we had peer-to-peer -peer sort of sharing and, and resources? So like for us here, it would actually be really useful for us here at, at Camp.js, for instance, because if we were all part of this kind of mesh network and sharing resources, and then suddenly, you know, we'd, we'd all downloaded certain thing, we're all at Microsoft.com, no, I <laughs> You know, we, we, we went to a site, then those resources could be cached on someone else's machine and you would just bring it across from the peer-to-peer -peer network rather than so. They got acquired by Yahoo because Yahoo quite liked the idea. Um, probably a talent acquisition, um, but, but you know, they, it's, it's interesting tech. And, and people are, there, there are some people doing really good thinking about saying, okay, like, if we have peer-to-peer -peer networking in the browser, what does that mean? Yeah. And, and it really is shaking things up. And there's another startup doing this um, very recently, um, which, so if you go to youtube.com and then other people in your local areas also watching that video, instead of it just streaming from youtube.com, it'll also stream what's been downloaded on other people's computers as well in your local area. So like that cuts down, like I think they cut down um, server side costs by like 80% in the trial. So it's really exciting because you can stream like 1080p content like right away. Um, so, Web components. Now, web components are really nifty because they've actually been around the entire time. Um, the browser vendors have always just been hanging out on us. So if we actually check out this little input text field, right, we'll see shadow root. Now, shadow root is what denotes a web component. Um, it's one of the standards of web components. So if we go inside, we'll actually see, hey, look, there's a div called inner editor, and then there's an input type text which is a bit redundant because it's gonna be like a circular dependency maybe. But you can start seeing that these custom elements that browser vendors have been using are actually just web components. So they've been doing their own styling and things like that on these types of things and it's been you know, working quite well for them for many, many years. And then eventually they were like, you know, developers started requesting and as well the Chrome team because they're actually web developers on that team as well. They've been thinking, hey, how can we expand this and move this forward? 
So now we can actually start extending the native elements, um, creating our own, and we can start creating custom elements. Now, when you create a custom element, that just means creating your own tag and giving it specific abilities. The Shadow DOM allows you to, with that tag, not have it interfered by anything else. So any other JavaScript, any other CSS styles, anything else. So that time when we had to be concerned about CSS pollution is no longer around. We can now actually create an element and then have it completely encapsulated, encapsulated, encapsulated um, within itself. So it's not going to get interfered with anything else. They did originally have a spec to allow it so it could inherit stylus, but then they decided this is a terrible idea and they got rid of that spec. Um, now there's another bit which is, you know, if you're creating these custom elements that are in, oh my gosh, that are by themselves, right? Um, how do you share them? So the stand behind that is called HTML imports. That's pretty much just like a script element or a link rel um, ref for your style sheets, but actually just for web components. So now you start doing a link rel I think it's import, um, and then you can import a web component from somewhere else into your page. So it kind of does away with package managers in a bit because you can just you know directly use a web component that's already hosted somewhere. But you probably do want to get those web components locally. The Polymer team are basically pushing forward with Bower for that. I'm quite hesitant with Bower for my own reasons, um, but Bower is probably looking at the best alternative for it right now. Now, as an example of of this, this is going to be so cool. So this is a web component made by one of the guys on the Polymer team. Oh, what have you done? Is it cool? All right, but I like it. So if we look into the um, the source for this, we'll see. Okay, it's now a custom element called Gainom Style. So if we actually look at the source for this. All we're going to see is Gainom Style, right? And then that contains everything that we could possibly want. And then we import the web component just like this. So if we go here, can anyone see that? Or do I, I probably need to make the text like way bigger. So we've got the link rel import. That's the HTML import standard, imports our web component. And then we use our web component just like a normal tag. Now, if you look inside our web component page, this is the one that was imported. We now actually have our definition of this element. So we have our CSS styles, whatever, we have all our content, but none of this is exposed, none of this is interfered with because of the ability of Shadow DOM. So if we go inside, then we can start seeing every single part that is a part of this, right? So, pretty cool. Now hopefully I can go back. Let's cross my fingers. Yes! <laughs> I'm not connected to the internet, so that's really cool for the slides team. Writing, I can actually intro. Yeah, sweet. Where are we? Why should we care? What are they? Do it done together. So, Damon, no wait. I can demo this locally. We originally were gonna demo it from my computer and then could all join in. Um, but my Wi-Fi on my computer isn't working. Is your Wi-Fi? Actually, you know what we could do? We could just go. All right, so that's kind of like some of the potential you get to use, right? Um, so, how do they work? What do I need to know to use them? So WebRTC, you need a signaling server. Um, so it's not completely client-side. I, I, Damien will kill me if I didn't use this metaphor I used earlier. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm back, I'm just stepping back <laughs> from the metaphors, dude. But, um, <laughs> but, so if you consider um, when you're setting up your application, initially everyone's like two blind people in a football field trying to play tag, right? They're not going to be able to. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to be able to get there, right? So they need someone to be able to guide them so they can get there. Like they need a Marco Polo game or whatever it needs to be, right? So they can actually start playing tag together. Um, so a signaling server is kind of like that. So now they can actually find each other, and then once they found each other, then they're good. It can now be completely client side. So the other thing you need to know is network topologies. Actually, for the signaling server, um, you, there's a few free ones. Nectar operates their own free ones, so you don't have to worry about that, which is really nice. Yeah, and I, I would just point out this time, signaling servers are one of those things that you do have to be a little bit aware of. I think I think there's both. There's our the one we've done in the Nectar part of the RTCIO one in the end. Yet guys have also got one that you can use 
that doesn't bind you to to an open like there's there's a lot of people saying hey we've got a cool framework to do web RDC and make it easy but you have to use our signaling server and that's actually where they monetize so so just be aware that sometimes that that, that is the catch um, so signaling is a really important part of web RDC as Ben said if you can't find each other you can't talk to each other and finding each other across the internet is is not exactly a small task yeah and um, there's an aspect to that as well, which is like proxies and firewalls can play havoc. And, and that's almost not signaling. That's definitely not signaling. Yeah. But, but there is that part of WebRTC. I've, I've described WebRTC as a spec that I've, I've seen a lot of specs in my time and, and done a fair bit of web dev, and I've never come across anything that is anything like WebRTC. This thing is a, an iceberg. Essentially, you start and you're like, oh, I'm capturing media. This kicks ass. Oh, I'm talking <laughs> with another person on my local network. This is awesome. And then you're like, and then I need to talk to people outside of my network. This gets a bit complicated. And, and you will end up playing with a whole pile of stuff, actually. It's, it's, it's fun to play with, but, and I think the, the whole point of what Ben, the journey that Ben and I are on is I wanted to make this kind of simple for programmers to get into. And I think when Ben started talking to me about it, he had a vision of making that even more accessible and broadening that out to, to people who hack web pages. And, and, that, and that could be anyone. And you know, I think with web components, you could see it end up in crazy tools like Wix, which we're seeing advertised on TV now, and you know, promises of people being able to make their own stuff. Yeah. So it's uh, Ben's vision is very good. I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite as nice. <laughs> um, so the other thing you need to know in order to use WebRTC is network topologies. Um, this is like an area where if you're coming in new, it, w it will drive you crazy. But luckily you have me and my experience and Damon's experience to save you that, that tedium. Um, so network topologies, there's pretty much two that are the primary ones. The so one that you, so they are peer-to-peer, um, -peer, like a me complete me mesh network. So um, everyone if you have a connection so four people sign up to the same open up the same communication app right um they will all be connecting directly to each other so yeah four people are talking to each other you're going to have 16 connections um so each person will have a connection to them and then also probably a connection back so it's probably going to be like 32 connections there's a number yeah multiplicative. so it's pretty it's big not, yeah you can see that it doesn't scale so th right. this is a great tech for, for basically once you're getting to more than four participants, the, the full mesh topology starts to break down. Yeah. And even then it's stretched. And, and it's you, not even the network topology sometimes, it's actually the video decoding and encoding, but that's another issue yeah. altogether. So. so if you have like a chat app, um, a mesh network will work perfectly well. Um, if you have a calling application, it's gonna break um, if you have more than four people. If you're doing like video calling on like a MacBook Air and there's more than four people, your MacBook Air will just freeze and you will have to hard restart it. Um, so it's, it's an awesome freeze too because it's like completely unresponsive yeah. but super hot at the same time. <laughs> like the fan will start going <laughs> and like you can't touch anything. <laughs> so yeah, if we can show you how to do a WebRTC demo so if you have your laptop on you, just head out and you won't be cold at all. Just so it's like when people mean like the bleeding edge, like this is the bleeding edge. It's probably more like the, the fan flying edge as well. That's probably like another way to call it. Um, but the mesh network is is very simple. You don't have to do anything to set up. It's pretty much automatic for you. Um, the other network is like a, a well, what would you call it? Uh, well, it's pretty much like an MCU. It's, it's more just client to server. So, so yeah. you have the opportunity to. So while this is peer to peer technology, there. We're starting to see, and, and once again, the, a lot of these are commercial offerings, but there are some open source ones appearing, which are guiding the traffic into a central server, bundling all the connections, all the video streams together, and then spitting one back out. So, so more what we're used to in terms of, say, broadcast, like what Flash and broadcast were doing before, you were seeing similar things. And actually, people who were some of the big players, and I will shout out to, to one company that I think are doing a good job, they've got Sydney devs, really nice guys, um, Topbox and other people using WebRTC and, and they've made some really good steps in, in, in that sort of stuff. It is something you have to pay for but you know if you've got some money to burn, even if it's the money to just spend, then, then they could be a good option for being able to scale beyond the 4 to 4 sort yeah. of stuff. And they're actually stable like now. They're so it, it, there's, there's two options right, one is you sign up for like one of these big partners and you start using WebRTC right away. 
The other way is like you do it yourself and you wait like two years until the open source infrastructure is there. Well, and, and the point <laughs> is too, the more people getting involved in doing open source stuff too, the, the quicker we can push that yeah. forward as well. So, yeah. so it, it's quite nifty. So the way that um, way works is instead of having you know everyone communicating to each other, they just communicate directly to one server. That server then, um, so if I'm talking to four different people, I have one connection to the server and one upstream from the server. Um, and that one downstream will contain, well, my sending to the server will just contain my webcam feed and my audio feed and my data or whatever. Um, and then the upstream will contain the three other people's um, videos and the calls, right? So it's way more effective in terms of bandwidth utilization, in terms of like pretty much everything, it, it's better. Um, however, it does require you have a very expensive server somewhere. And they're generally called a media control unit. There is one or two open source projects um, allowing you to set up your own one if you have your own hardware. Um, however, at this stage, you know, it, it's very like hacky early days. So <laughs> probably like if you imagine like the beginning of Node, that's what like this these days are like. Yeah, and, and come and, and come and talk to me if you are interested in doing that stuff, because I've sifted through. Yeah. Is this how similar is this to the SIP trap as Yeah. Switch, so. yeah, we're in that boat as well because obviously as part of people thinking about WebRTC, we still have to talk to SIPs in some cases as well. So, but you're right. There's a lot of the the it's the same people operating in the space. So we'll see a lot of similar mentalities there. But there is more disruption coming from potential open source people saying, "Hey, the the, the big guys haven't done a really good job of engaging that." Um, and, and and I think like open source projects can be really good or they can be really bad. And I think what we see in this kind of modular sort of world of, of Node is that the projects that focus on doing one thing and doing one thing well and then give you opportunity to extend that in a, in a sensible way are the ones that I actually gravitate towards myself personally. And there is one MCU that I believe is doing that. It's, it's being developed by a crazy Italian. And I, I, I've met him and I think he's pretty all right. <laughs> and, and that's a project called, it's, it's, it's Janus, so J-A-N-U-S. Yeah. Um, so you can Google that, you know. yeah. but that that's the one that I think is showing the best promise from yeah. a long-term sustainability open source perspective. Yeah, and there's another one that like an Indian telco provider, but like they're like a in in your basement telco provider. Well, isn't it? But isn't that a whole Java stack? Like I just I just got that I running on Qrento or something, and I was like, man, I'm not. I tried installing that. Yeah. And this is the point. Like I've every one of these that we look at, I go, I'm going to try installing that, and I just go, that is crap. You know, <laughs> and. Janos I had up and running, like almost the same kind of level as, you know, when you just start Redis and you go, oh wow, Redis was so easy to install and run, Janos was that. Yeah. And I was like, what? This is nuts. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was really good. Cool. All right, so for web components, what do you need to know? Um, now, in my opinion, it saved you a lot of time. What you need to know is Polymer. Um, Polymer is a polyfill framework library uh, made by the Google Chrome team as well. Um, and what it does is it polyfills the web standards around web components for older browsers. They have a polyfill layer, so it's gonna work with older browsers as well, um, which is really cool. And then the other thing which they're doing is kind of like how with ES6, how we get to practice like the new ES6 standards earlier with like the Harmony flag or with um, Traceur, the project. So with preprocessors, we get to try out new features. So with the Polymer team, they're also experimenting with other new features as well, not new standards that could eventually one day become official standards. So the, the way the operation kind of works is there's like the Polymer team, and then there's like the Chrome team, and then there's the standards team. So the Polymer team has this playground where they can experiment with the future. Um, then they say, hey, look, we've got some good ideas. They talk to the Chrome team about it, get it converted into a web standard. And then the Chrome team then talks to the standards body and then gets it converted into a new standard that other people can use, like other browser vendors. Um, so one of the most important standards here that Polymer is pushing for is model-driven views. Now, if you use Angular, it's pretty much exactly the way Angular works with the declarative bindings. Um, if you use Backbone, imagine, I'm not really sure how you, I've always rolled custom solutions, but it's just like a, a declarative two-way binding from your view and your model. 
So if you update like a, a text field, that's automatically gonna update the, like a text field for a model's name, it's automatically gonna update the model. If you update the model's attribute for the name, it's also going to update the text field directly. Now, the declarability of this allows you to do some really cool things, um, which is really nice. Now, there's also an opinion side to Polymer, so there's not just a polyfill, there's also an opinion side, and their opinion is that everything should be an element. Um, even Ajax requests. Now, when you think about an Ajax request being an element, it's pretty like, this is crazy talk. Why, why would you ever want an Ajax request being an element? But as you start getting into this, it makes like a lot of sense. Um, so if you actually have, you know, say, Polymer-Ajax, and then you can say URL equals the URL, and then you can say like on response. And then with that data, you can then pipe that directly to somewhere else using declarative bindings. So it actually allows you to start putting together all these different elements in a very concise way, which is really nifty without any JavaScript code, um, or hopefully without any JavaScript code. The JavaScript more serves as a scaffold rather than actually any business logic, which is really nice. Now, they also have a whole bunch of elements because they follow that mantra um, that you can already use. So some base ones like Polymer Ajax, as well as things like Accordion and actual UI libraries you can use. So together, that's gonna be incredibly tiny, but let me zoom in. Uh, so that's going to be oh you can read that that's good so if you imagine what WebRTC looks like using web components it would look like this so we get the webcam feed so say RTC media um, that will pull in the webcam feed um, for our local thing then what we do is we create a room um, so this now establishes a connection anyone who gets that now joins the same room um, and then anyone who joins will be added to the peers object, right? Now inside the peer, for each peer inside peers, let's add a stream, right? So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna add my stream URI and send that to each peer, right? Now, if anyone has any concerns, let me know because I'll walk through, right? So this sets up the connections and starts sending our own webcam to everybody else, right? All the peers who connected. Uh, right. Is that part of work components? <laughs> now, the next thing we want to do is we want to show everybody. So we're going to create another web component um, instantiated called Facewall. Now I'm just called it People, whatever. And we're going to show our own face, but we're going to have ourselves muted um, because we don't want to hear ourselves. Otherwise, the webcam is going to go like. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do is we pass it our own stream um, and we give it my name which is defined somewhere else right now for each peer inside peers with peers is set automatically up here we now want to show the faces so we'll get the in streams from the peer and also show the peers name so that's essentially what the code for the interconnect thing will look like once we've cleaned it up a bit but that's the potential in terms of how can we actually create like a, a, a great web RTC chat application without, in the simplest way we possibly can, um, at a good bare bones levels, which is really nifty. And like, so for daemon stuff, it's using JavaScript and things. And then these would use daemons um, or Nectar's um, RTC. I mean, you can call it mine, but it's yeah. mine. But Nectar <laughs> paid for it, right. and it's really theirs. Yeah. <laughs> So when I showed Damon this stuff, he was really excited. Well, I, it, for me, I, I actually have a module in the RTC IO suite called RTC Glue where I started doing some of this stuff with just video elements and things. And I, everything I tried to do was, was quite, I, I was very proud of it at the time, um, but to be honest, from now, I, I really kind of want to aggressively deprecate that model, a module and just say, look, you don't want Glue. You know, if you want to use my stuff at a JavaScript level, then, then absolutely. And, and I would love to show you how to do that. But if you wanted to muck around with a tag base, you know, declarative way of working with um, WebRTC, then I would be definitely pointing this way. Um, because I, one, I know how passionate Ben is about it. <laughs> and, and, and two, it, it's, it's work, like when he showed me web components, and I'm still, you know, when you, if you do want to do some web components working through with Ben, then I really should be sitting in there with you because I, I, I don't know what I'm doing with web mm -hmm. components. And to be honest, Ben's achieved something that I didn't think was going to be very easy. And that's, that's someone crafting something for one consumer experience. Basically, you would use this stuff through a browserify kind of interface 
and then saying, and here's some web components that go with it. That's, that weirded me out a little, mm. to be honest. Um, so it was great. It was really impressive. Yeah. yeah, so you can imagine like just that and then other people creating their own web components on top of that and on top of that, and then you can start combining them and remixing them. So it's quite cool, the potential. Yep. So that looks like pseudocode. So, so that's the way it will work. Um, that's what we prototype because we're like, how can we actually show you what it's going to look like? Um, this is what it currently looks like right now. Um, so this is the Interconnect app you saw before. So this is just the RTC app. Um, geez, maybe we can turn the lights off. Is that possible? There's like a light switch like right there behind the guys sleeping or tethering. <laughs> Is that it? Wrong switch. Oh, that's the middle. Whoa, oh, nice there we go. Oh, no. All right, so that's kind of helped. Um, so what we do here, right, is remember that everything should be an element. Um, so what we do is we store the person's name inside local storage. So in the key, my name. So that's really cool. And then we fetch it from local storage, um, get called it my name, and then we pass it over to the person. So the person right now in the room panel, this is the face wall. Um, and then the ITC person is the face. So we pass it over the name, pass it over the my stream URI, um, which we get from there. The snapshot URIs, which is the black and white snapshots every second, um, and that's done through the video proc element. So the video proc element, we say the filter we want, very Instagram style, right? And then we, it would then generate this my snapshot URI, which is then piped into there. So Polymer allows us to, you know, it listens to everything, it, it gives us everything as soon as it happens. So there's no longer like all these, like if anyone's done this stuff in Backbone, um, doing it manually, it's like so much jQuery events all the time. And then like, you know, binding those things together, it's a mess. And like here, it's so easy. So it's really nifty. Um, well, I think, I think it's a good point question, I know. Uh, so yep. Yeah, so I, I forgot to mention this. Um, the Polymer team is, you know, because it's by Google, um, is very close with the Angular team, which is also by Google. So the Polymer Foundation is actually going to be the foundation of Angular 2. So Angular 2 is going to be using Polymer. So that's, that's like, oh my gosh. Um, so that's like how heavily invested Google are into this. Like, this is really nifty because like everything you see here is like very beta right now. Like Polymer's on like version 0.2.4, but like these are going to be the foundations for the future in the same way year six is. Um, yeah, so if we open up like this RDC app, we define like this web component here, um, and then we define a bunch of properties um, and do it all. So the reason why this looks different from the one I just showed in that slide is because that's how easy it will be. And when I said the bleeding edge, it's bleeding edge. <laughs> so, you know, we're gonna simplify that and make it a lot easier. And the thing is, like, so far it's just been me and a few bunch of other people, but, you know, if anyone wants to help out, like, by all means, like, help out, because besides, like, maybe the two people in this room and a bunch of other people, like, the open source initiatives for this is, like, very early days. Yeah, and I think, I think the thing, too, is, like, Ben and I have talked a lot, and if you want to have a good conversation about what it's like to feel a bit worn out from doing open source, Ben's a person to <laughs> definitely talk to. And, and I think, like, it's really good that Ben's passion hasn't been sort of um, gone through, even though that he's feel like he's had to work really hard with Docpad and things like that. But I think there's a lot to learn from saying, especially when you're building something that's got an API, and an API could be tags and anything like that, is to kind of try and keep your head down. Like for me at least, RDCIO has been a product in the mating for eight months, and I rarely tweet about it, I rarely kind of try and talk about it, and it's really only, Ben, you must have accidentally discovered it somehow, right? I, I'd maybe tweet every now and again, but for the most part, under the radar. It did hit Hacker News once and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's my same reaction yeah. something I get. Yeah. So, so the, the, the point is to basically, but I guess to say, like, I'm happy with RTCIO now, especially around Quick Connect and the stuff we're going to be talking about today. Um, all of that, I felt like I've gone through iterations and I've ripped things in, put things out, ripped them out, and, but now I feel really comfortable with it. And I think what Ben's saying is, is with this, this kind of next layer above, that's still very much evolving. If you're willing to go with us on that journey and you want to pitch in and, and, have, and contribute to what that looks like and how that feels, great. But 
feel free to use the project, but don't get upset if it breaks. Like we're not we're showing you a picture of the future, but it's it's not set in stone yet. No. Cool. Any any other questions right now? Yep. Uh, yeah, I had a question about uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, about um, putting out the broadcast, or essentially share a broadcast like a YouTube video with a peer or a torrent from a peer. Yep. Um, are there techniques to make sure that what you get is actually what YouTube originally sent out? Um, I'm sure there are. Like the, the, those those projects have been worked on by like professors at universities with like a bunch of funding. Yeah, there's, so, there's, there's a couple of things that make that really interesting, and the fact that like I wouldn't be able to tell you how to do that—that's that's beyond my pay grade or beyond my intelligence level. Um, <laughs> but the the great thing is what we have in in peer to peer in the browser, which is which is really kicks butt, is we have the video, and and most often not these guys won't be using the video in that case; they'll be actually using the data channel. And, and the data channel supports binary types, so which we know in the browser now. Now, you can pretty much do anything in those binary types, all those bin you know, the native types in the browser that you can do in Node. And, and it's worth, I think, if I don't know if the ByteWiser workshop's going on again, or if you do learn you a Node, that, that's probably worth just playing with some of that stuff because everything that you can kind of do in native, now you can reason about somehow and get into the browser in that scope. And I'm, I'm sure, Paul loves his security. I'm sure there'd be some stuff there that he could probably even say, well, here's maybe a technique he'd use. And then we could sort of look around and see who's doing that in JavaScript. There's a couple of guys I know, Dominic Tarr, um, definitely thinking about that stuff. Um, so I think we'll see it emerge if it's not there already. Cool. So any other questions before we jump onto the workshop? Like now would be the oh, time. Yeah. Yep. Um, what I need help with. Um, so right now, everything, a, cl a, a, a clone of me. Um, but no, like if, if you want to help out, like I, just chat to me afterwards or chat to Damon. Like I'm handling all the web component stuff. Damon's handling like all the low level nitty gritty JavaScript stuff. So um, just chat to us and, and by all means, like we'll let you know how you can help out the best. Yeah, and I think after you've done some of the work, like we are doing, gonna hit a bit of a choose your own adventure point in, in a minute. And that's gonna say, look, would you like to play with WebRTC? And, and, and I think I've got some pretty good structured stuff for going through that. And you, you can probably have a look at that and then go on the web components pretty quick. Um, so the pathway is pretty much, if you wanna look at web components and web components are what you're really into, then I think Ben can really do some, some hands-on stuff with you about how do you build a web component. Yeah. I think the probably the most logical path for everyone, if they want to go with it, is to, to basically work through what... I've started working on an RTC IO guidebook um, using require, the techniques that require Ben has and everything like that. So basically, it feels like an interactive book. It actually will publish to LeanPub as well, so it'll be like a PDF copy if you want it as well. That's not so interactive, obviously. Um, you can print it and whack someone with it, I guess, if that's a little interactive. Um, but it's, I think, doing that to start with, and you can kind of pick and choose. You can play with get user media, you can start with working with peer connections. Um, and then if you want to see how that wraps in a web component, definitely have a chat to Ben. That is, that is fluid. That's, that's still in a state of flux. Web components are not so much in a state of flux. So if someone wants to say, well, how do I build a, you know, an image? What, what does the, you know, let's deconstruct the button. Have a look at that. So we've got a lot of content you can choose from, and it is going to be a bit choose your own adventure. -ish. Yeah. So that's pretty much like the things we have. So where about to see Damon? Um, in terms of the web components, um, for the workshop in regards to web components, will be like get Polymer going, get a media going, and then start applying a filter um, to it, so black and white and things like that. We can start getting chat and stuff going, but at this stage, the abstractions around that won't be, um, like you can get it up, but you're just getting interconnect up at that stage. It's not gonna be getting your own custom map up. Um, so we can go that route and I can explain that. Um, what what would you wanna cover, Damon, just like in your WebRTC? Yeah, stuff well, so, so I'm, I'm gonna sort of let people go at it yeah. from the WebRTC perspective. I've, I've dropped in the, um, the lovely intranet, which is, Fantastic lime. Um, there is a link in the sidebar for the guidebook, which is working in the local room here. Uh, Jeff, I got Jeff to test it before. I don't think I fixed one bug, which was stopping things working. There may be one more. Um, but that's designed for you to be able to consume it a little bit, play with a few examples, and, and experience what it's like to, to work with WebRTC. Okay. And I've tried to expose you to a little bit of the pain as well, but also the stuff that you don't now no longer have to worry about. Yeah. So I, I think 
that to me makes like a lot of sense to at least touch that and then to migrate, as I said, into to the WebRTC workshop. So I guess I guess maybe just can, for Ben and I, if we can get a show of hands, like who who wants to get like I think most people maybe want to get a taste of WebRTC. Who who wants to play the long game and go web components? Yeah, and I think so. What I would try and do is just say, if, if you're in for the long game, which is a web component, just gather there. And I, Ben, I would say you focus. Well, probably, well, probably what we can do. How long is your thing going to take? It's like thirty minutes, right? It's it's almost open ended. All right. So, um, who by a show of hands, we can do it one way. We can either split off, so I just do web components and Damon does web RTC, or the alternative is Damon does web RTC first and then we do web components second. Let's so. Just do that. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's do that one then. Like yep. yep. Well, yeah. I think we can do that. And remember, so what we'll probably do is then, when we're getting close to time that, that it's kicking the web component stuff, we'll basically just say, look, you've played with WebRTC, pay attention again, and then we'll do some web, uh, web components, I guess. And at that point, if you do want to keep playing with the guidebook, it's pretty easy to do that after. Yep. So it's, yeah. Sweet. All right, so that will end the presentation aspect. Um, so. That's the details, but um, thanks and we'll stick us out with the workshop. Cheers. Sweet. So I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Um, leave your comments below and remember like it. Um, any constructive criticism would be nice. If you have something negative to say, make sure you phrase it well so it doesn't hurt my feelings and I get the benefit out of it. Um, thanks so much. Like it. You know, do whatever you need to do. Cheers. Bye.